Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Macker. I am a uh, professor of strategy, economics, and policy in the Georgetown McDonough School of Business. I'm also the academic director of the Center for Business and Public Policy. Um, the Center for Business and Public Policy was founded in 2002 as a nonpartisan academic research center. It engages scholars, industry practitioners, and policymakers on issues that are at the nexus of business and public policy. Our emphasis is on the evolution of innovation, competition, and regulation. Uh, we do this through two principal activities, publications, and events. This event, the Georgetown on the Hill series, is a signature series that takes, normally, academics down to Capitol Hill. With COVID, we're unable to do that, so we move to the internet. So what we usually do is a series of presentations and panel discussions on current legislative issues and something on the legislative agenda. This series uh, is termed New Debates and Tensions in Antitrust. Previous uh, discussions that we've had in this series have looked at platforms, how to handle big tech, and what does the future hold for uh, antitrust policy. This specific uh, topic that we're covering today, competition, concentration, and antitrust, squaring the circle is what we're going to be talking about over the next uh, hour and a half. My role is to moderate the chat for questions posed to the panelists by you all. So please send those questions in and I'll be reviewing them. But my other role is to introduce the moderators. We have two moderators, Mark Whitener and John Mayo. Uh, Mark Whitener is an adjunct professor here at Georgetown McDonough. He's also a senior policy fellow in the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Mark spent his career practicing antitrust law, first in private practice in DC, then as deputy director of the FTC's Bureau of Competition, and finally, as the Global Antitrust Council for General Electric. He's a graduate of the University of Chicago's Law School. He's held leadership positions in the ABA, and he's written and spoken widely on uh, antitrust issues. John Mayo is my uh, colleague and co-author. He's the Elsa Carlson McDonough Chair in Business Administration and a professor of economics, business, and public policy at Georgetown's McDonough School of Business. He is also the executive director of the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy and widely published in the areas of IO, antitrust, and regulation. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark to take over and introduce the panelists. Mark. Okay. Thanks, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. So <clears throat> here we are again for an antitrust discussion. Antitrust policy is in the spotlight. I would say we're in the midst of the most intense antitrust debate in decades. And there are several reasons for this. Some antitrust policy arguments are driven mainly by ideology. So we see neo-Brandeisians and populists squaring off against Borkian, if that's a word, free marketeers over the true meaning of the antitrust laws. Others' views are shaped more by broader attitudes about the role, for example, of big tech in society. But there's also an empirical debate that is driving the antitrust policy discussion, and that is our focus today. At the heart of the antitrust reform narrative are several propositions which are being put forward, not only by pro-enforcement think tanks and academics, but also now by the new leaders at the FTC and DOJ and in the president's executive order on competition. These propositions include that the US economy has become more concentrated, that this has resulted in a less competitive economy, and that failed antitrust policies are largely responsible. Now, these are empirically testable assertions, so they need to be understood, examined, and tested. Imagine a policy discussion about major policy issues like climate change or trade policy that lacked a grounding in data about what is actually going on and about the effects of policy on that reality. Well, maybe that's not so hard to imagine because too many policy debates these days devolve into partisanship or other ideologies. We want to help make sure that the antitrust policy discussion avoids that fate. And today we have a terrific panel of experts to help us do that. So I'll introduce our panelists in the order in which they will then make some brief opening remarks, and then we will turn to some back and forth discussion. We will save time at the end for your questions, which you can submit via the Q&A option. So with that, I'll introduce the panelists. Uh, Thomas Philippon is the Max L. Heine Professor of Finance at the New York University Stern School of Business. He has received numerous awards, including me being named one of the top 25 economists under 45 in 2014, winning, winning the Bernese Prize for Best European Economist under 40, 
and receiving the 2009 prize for best young French economist. Thomas has spent various, has studied various topics in microeconomics and finance, and his recent book, The Great Reversal, focuses on the increasing market power of large firms, a topic that's highly relevant to our discussion today. Thomas graduated from Ecole Polytechnique, received his PhD in economics from MIT, and joined NYU in 2003. Esteban Rossi Hansberg is the Glenn Lloyd Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago. Before that, he was Theodore Wells Professor of Economics at Princeton. Esteban earned his PhD from the University of Chicago. His research specializes in international trade, regional and urban economics, and growth and organizational economics. He's published extensively in all the major economics journals and has received numerous awards, including the Alfred Sloan Research Fellowship, the August Loesch Prize, the Jeffrey Hewings Award, and the Robert E. Lucas Prize. Esteban is also an elected fellow of the Econometric Society. And finally, Luke Frobe is the William C. Omig Chair in Free Enterprise and Entrepreneurship at the Owen Graduate School of Management at Vanderbilt. He has spent his professional life going in and out of academia and the government, serving as Chief Economist of the Antitrust Division at the U.S. Department of Justice, and before that, as Chief Economist at the FTC. Luke has published dozens of papers in journals such as the RAND Journal of Economics, the Journal of Econo Econometrics, the Journal of Law, Economics, or and Organization, and the Antitrust Law Journal. He received his A.B. in Economics from Stanford and his Ph.D. in Econometrics from the University of Wisconsin. So with that, I will turn it over to Thomas to kick us off with some brief opening remarks. Thomas. Thank you very much. So it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. So um, as a matter of introduction, um, since we are focusing on concentration, the first thing any economist would say is that concentration is a market outcome. By itself, it's neither good or bad. It could be a good sign or it could be a bad sign, depending on what's driving the concentration. So typically, good concentration comes with low prices and high productivity, and almost always, at least in recent years, with a lot of intangible investment. And we see that in retail and wholesale trade, for instance. Bad concentration comes with high prices and low productivity because the driving force there are buyers to entry. And I would argue we see that in telecoms, airlines, and healthcare. So just to fix ideas, here's the classic example that we has seen many times. This is Walmart, and I think it's the poster child for good concentration. The market share went from essentially zero in 1970 to uh, more than 50% uh, in uh, the mid 2000. Uh, but as the expansion of Walmart uh, happened, and it was as uh, spectacular as ever, uh, you can see the profit margin was uh, flat or even slightly declined, okay? which means that every 1% productivity gain that Walmart made, that allowed Walmart to increase its market share, was passed on as lower prices to consumer, and therefore the profit margin stayed flat. So when we see that as economists, we are pretty happy. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are many other sectors where we see the opposite. So like telecom, for instance, where you see the markup and the concentration ratio going up uh, together and by large amount, I should say. So that today, uh, if you look at the prices, the uh, US consumers pay at least twice as much as Europeans do for uh, telecommunication services. That's true for wireless, and it's even more true for uh, cable uh, at home, for high-speed internet. So that's for, uh, I think, the, the big picture, which some, some, con some sectors are going to have high concentration for good reasons, some for bad reasons. And the job of the economy is to figure out the balance. My view is on balance, it's been pretty bad over the past 20 years. But of course, that's not to say that it's true in every single sector. Now, concentration, unfortunately, is a static measure. It's just, it just looks at uh, a snap snapshot at a point in time of the distribution of market shares in an industry. And uh, I think it's actually sometimes more informative, although it's harder to measure, so we don't do it as often, but it's more informative to look at the turnover of market share. So this plots the probability of uh, turnover. So literally, this is the probability that if you're in the top uh, five or top 10 of your industry at a point in time, what's the likelihood that five years later, you've been replaced by somebody else? And it used to be around 12%, and now it's around uh, 7%. What that means is that it's not so much that the concentration is high or low, you know, which we can debate. But the problem is, in my view at least, is that uh, firms are entrenched. Okay? The fear of being replaced uh, has decreased. Okay? Um, or if you want, the competition for the market has declined. 
Um, this is a, looking at all firms, if you look at the top 100 US companies, uh, which I think sometimes also an easier metric to, uh, to understand, ask yourself, um, out of the top firms today, so again, top here means top 100, out of the top firms today, how many have been in the top 10 for the previous 10 years? So in 2000, 45, that means if you look at the top 10 firms in 2000, 45 of them had been in the top 10 continuously from 1991 to 2000. And today it's 71%. Okay, so it's kind of just showing the same fact, which is that market shares, are, firms are getting more entrenched. Okay, we see less turnover at the top, which to me is, the, is one possible sign of lack of competition. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about in this brief introduction is the evolution of profits or markups. Many ways to measure, lots of controversies there, but what's not controversial is the profit margins of US companies have increased a lot more than the profit margins of about any other countries in the world. So if you benchmark, benchmark by Europe, in Europe, the profit margins are flat. The profit share of GDP is flat. The labor share, which is the inverse of that, is also flat. In the US, profit have gone up by um, something like uh, 10 points over the past uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, so a lot more than um, in the US than, than in Europe. Um, and the question is, what do firms do with the money? Okay. So in fact, I would argue today, the crux of the debate is not so much necessarily uh, concentration. It's what do firms do with the money? And there, I think it's important to understand that there is, I'm gonna make it simple. Two broad classes of, of expression. One is intangible investment. The other is just market power. Now the market power says that firms are gonna use the money to, to just pay higher dividends. So we're gonna see higher prices uh, in the stock market, which we do. We're gonna see higher dividends, uh, which we do. Dividend yield, by the way, hasn't really changed. Um, so that's one explanation. The other is that, no, no, what happens is that firms are investing a lot, but we are not very good at measuring this intangible investment. Okay. And to be honest, it's actually tricky to disentangle these two explanations. But a very, very nice recent paper by uh, Atkinson, Hiscott, and Perry has done just that. So they've said, suppose explanation one is markups, then why should that see in the big picture? The other one is, suppose explanation is intangible investment instead. Why should I see in the big picture? So the first thing is, of course, in the data, corporate payouts have increased a lot. Okay, so this, this, is, the, this is dividend over a value added. And you can see it went from like 4% to 8%, so it's double. So companies are making a lot of money and they are increasing a lot their dividend payments. Okay. But they don't do only that. They say, suppose instead that it's mismeasured investment. And in fact, this dividend, you could even argue, it could be like payment for intangible investment. So it's the return of capital maybe is not as high as we think because there's a lot of intangible investment going on in the background. The problem with that story is it predicts the completely counterfactual evolution of the uh, net foreign asset position and the trade balance uh, for the US. Okay. So based on aggregate data, including uh, the trade balance of the US, they can rule out the idea that the massive increase in payouts and profit within the US is compensation for large intelligence investment. This investment did, just did not happen. What happened is firms increased their profits and used the money to pay higher dividend to their shareholders. Okay, so I think that's four minutes. So in the interest of time, I will stop here and hand over. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Uh, Esteban, over to you. Yes, um, so thank you for, for including me in this discussion. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of agreement with what Thomas just said. Let me, let me give you my view about what has happened in the US economy over uh, the last several decades. So when you think about national and concentration or concentration in general, and its effect on competition or its possible effect on competition, it's very important to think about the scope of the market. What is the market in which you know, firms are actually competing for cons uh, consumers? And so uh, in many markets for many industries in the US economy, uh, that market is not the whole country. It's a, a particular part of that country, a particular area. So it can be your city, it can be your neighborhood, it can be uh, your county. Uh, and, and this is more than kind of an intellectual discussion. This is uh, matters a lot for the trends that you measure in concentration. So what I have here in this graph 
is national concentration, that's the blue curve, and the fact that it has, and you can clearly see how that has been increasing over the last few decades since the 1990s and probably, you know, a little bit before that. Uh, and I also have the same trends at the local level, at the city level, CBSA, or at the county level or zip code level. And there you see a very different picture. You see a declining trend where local concentration has been falling rather than rising as we see at the national level. And this is extremely robust uh, to different forms of industrial aggregation. It's true for most uh, sectors in the US economy, depending a little bit on tradability, but you know, present everywhere. And it doesn't really depend on the particular measure of concentration that you use. Here, I'm using the Herfindahl index, but there's many other measures uh, for where, where, you can, where you can see these trends. And so the question is, how come? How, how can it be the case that at the national level, concentration is rising, but at the local level, it is falling? And the, and the, and the key culprit, if you will, is uh, our top firms. And so top firms are, have been growing uh, and they've been gaining you know, overall market share, thereby increasing national concentration. But at the same time, the way they've expanded is by expanding geographically, adding more plants, adding more establishments in more and more markets. And you can see in this, uh, this, in this graph where, again, you see the trend in national concentration, the trend in local concentration that I just I showed you in the previous graph. And I, you also see in the dashed lines, the same trends when I exclude the top firm. And what you see is that these top firms have contributed to the increase in national concentration. The solid line, the uh, yellow line is above this, the dashed yellow line, but they've also con contributed to the decline in local concentration. So what does that mean? It means that there were these local markets, these, these, these large top firms are entering these local markets and they are competing with whoever was there, which in general, you know, were, was a market that was not com that competitive in the first place. You know, to, so, so one stylized way to think about it, there was a local monopoly and then these the large firms are coming in and setting up an establishment and competing uh, with that local monopoly. And so what we see is that in fact, when these uh, large companies is, you know, enter a local market, um, concentration goes down and it stays down uh, for, for, for many years. And so you know, this is really the way these large firms are growing uh, is, is, is creating these diverging trends. And in some sense, the relevant trend for many markets is the local trend, not the national trend. And I wanna finish with this uh, slide which tells you, well, where is it that they are entering, right? What, how are these firms growing? And it's very clear that the way they are growing is by entering the smaller markets. So if you organize markets uh, by their size at the, in the late 70s, so in this graph, I have it in 1977, and then you ask, well, to what extent were top firms present in those markets? In 77, you see that the top firms um, were present you know, in the large cities and much less in the smaller towns in, in America. And so the people, the customers in the smaller towns in America didn't have access to the products of these firms, which you know, these are the top firms in the US. So probably the higher quality, the lower, the, the more efficient firms in the US, they didn't have access to these pro products. By uh, 2013, the blue curve, you see that that access has leveled off across markets. And so what that tells you is there's all these gains that the local cost, cost, uh, consumers in the smaller markets uh, have from having access to the firms of these top, uh, top, um, top um, producers, top firms. And so, you know, when we think about overall antitrust and when we think about the, the policy problem of limiting the growth of large firms, it's very important to think about this spatial expansion and the access to their products that they are giving to customers, because that's exactly the way we see we have seen them grow. Let me stop there. Esteban, thank you. Okay, and Luke, uh, over to you. Luke, you there? 
Oh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, can you see my slides? No, your screen your screen's not on yet. Oh, huh. Uh, huh. I think you need to start video first. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. All right, okay. Now we can see you. Okay, now right. let me uh, share share my slides. Share my slides. Okay, escape, hold on. Uh, just unplug this one. Sorry about these technical difficulties. Start the slideshow. Okay, uh, anyway, uh, can you see that? No, not yet. Luke, make sure you're sharing your screen uh, uh, for Zoom, uh, under Zoom, share your screen. Okay, uh, share screen, desktop. Okay, share. Okay, uh, can you see? Yeah, we can okay, see Okay, finally, okay, good, good, good. Okay, uh, still having a trouble, but uh, anyway, this this will this will go. So, um, can you guys you guys can see this? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks to everybody who organized this. Uh, I special thanks. These are <laughs> these are slides that I that I resurrected from a talk that I gave when I was at the Department of Justice, and uh, Greg Word Worden and Mike Vita helped, and I want to acknowledge their help. Uh, talk talk outlines very similar to Esteban, um, and uh, I just uh, you know I, I, I kind of I'm old enough to see a lot of this stuff come come back around. And uh, when when I was entering graduate school, you know it was all about price concentration regressions, cross cross industry regressions using census data, and uh, and uh, that was that was the debate back then and it's kind of funny how this has all come around but uh anyway hipster populist progressive the new brandeis critique of competition policy and i'm going to just talk about the first first two first two uh issues um i just note a little irony in the u.s uh brandeis gave us the rule of reason which basically led to uh, the effects-based analysis that we all do, which you know, frustrates the new leadership, at least at the FTC, which you know wants to bring more cases, but you know they have to delineate markets, you have to show competitive effects, and and all that takes time and is difficult, and they they think they know what's what's right. Um, so um, the same thing happened and when when I was at the effects-based uh, analysis replaced the structural presumptions in the U.S. and the EU. Um, and um, we measure effects uh, using a consumer welfare standard. EU seems to have started measuring uh, the, you know, the loss in competition by effects on competitors. And I point to the Google shopping case. And this is, this is, this is easier to do over there. Uh, it's, it's hard to do over here because, uh, because of the, the way the case law has evolved. Um, this point is similar to uh, Esteban's point. Uh, this it compares cases where we at the uh, Justice Department and FTC had a, uh, had public information on on the uh, the market delineated, you know, and and in antitrust we delineate markets as an area over which a hypothetical monopolist could exert market power, raise prices, and you see that the the distribution of Commerce is 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 mostly they're much much tinier the 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 antitrust markets are much much tinier than the census markets in which they you know that in which they would be classified so so the vast you know the vast majority are less than five percent of of uh, of of the the regular markets so they're really tiny relative to the census markets. And there's a couple here. There, this was one national market case where where it was very close to the to the census case. But but that was it's um, anyway. That's the kind of evidence of of Esteban's point. Um, and here's the reason why. And I think it's really important to get this through. And and imagine in 1998 uh, that there's a hundred a hundred firms and there's ten in each market and. And markets are the are on the horizontal axis, and the number of firms are on the horizontal axis. 
and uh, or the firms are on the horizontal axis. So these are each square represents a firm. Here we go down to ten firms. Each firm monopolizes one market. So and here we've got ten different monopolies in in ten different markets in the census data, and and the market HHI would be uh, ten thousand, which would be a monopolist. Uh, but this but the uh, but the sector HHI, you know, the industry HHI would only be a thousand, so you wouldn't you wouldn't see it would miss this this trend. Likewise, here's another situation where each each firm goes into all the ten different different markets. So each firm is horizontally diversified, and here you see um, no change in in concentration, even though the you know the firms have 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 gotten gotten much much uh, much bigger. Each firm has kind of gobbled up all the other firms in their market. I mean, uh, uh, each firm has entered each market, and uh, and you know, so there's only ten firms and rather than a hundred, and the uh, market market HHI doesn't change. And this is why this is why the this is the reason why these these uh, these um, census industry stuff doesn't doesn't match what we really care about um again this is this is uh, and we don't and so it misses it not only misses what's going on in an individual you know kind of case or industry but it also misses the trends and um anyway so bottom line margins um margins may signal widespread change in market structure or demand that could arise from several you know different causes but whatever the whatever the cause of increased margins, the way the the way the effects based analysis have, has evolved at the agencies is to kind of take the margins in account, calibrate the models that we use uh, to the to the you know the observed margins, and uh, and then do our standard kind of mo analysis to hey can we model what's going on? Can we model the loss of competition? Uh, in or model competition in this industry and the loss of competition following merger or or price fixing or monopolization in the industry. So so uh, so we take the margins into account. Um, in in the EU, they they've just passed a vague new uh, regulatory law, and uh, and the thing that the thing that you know you know is foreign to me as an American is that the EC will interpret it, enforce it, and rule on it. And uh, it kind of reminds me of the old Mickey Spillane uh, novel, Judge, Jury, and Executioner. And uh, it's just, you know, they don't have the kind of checks and balances that, that the US does, which allows them to move much more quickly, but uh, kind of makes me, make, makes me fear for, you know, the law, you know, what's going to happen. Uh, in the US, the new law hasn't made it out of the committee. The, I, you know, somebody else would on this panel would know way better than I what what the prospects are. Uh, but the new leadership uh, says that look, you know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna use the you know section five, which outlaws unfair methods of competition, to to prohibit contact that may not have to go through all this this methodological um, you know work to to bring a case. Uh, the problem with that is that we have this case law that's evolved uh, over 50 years that brings Section 5 in, you know, Section 5 and the Sherman Act are one and the same now. And uh, so, uh, so the, react, the reaction seems to be is to keep uh, mergers in, in administrative law, uh, law limbo and, and, and kind of, you know, extract a pound of flesh if you want to merge, say, hey, all future mergers uh, need prior approval from the FTC, and that kind of moves us towards a regulatory regime that that you know most people were enforcers, uh, or when I was at the agencies, that was uh, that was that was what we were trying to avoid. Um, anyway, I have some more slides about uh, profit, but uh, but let me just uh, turn it back over. Stop sharing. Stop sharing my screen. Turn it back over to the panel. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so thank you all. Uh, John, I'd like to turn it over to you to take us forward with some questions. Yeah, for thank you very, very much. Uh, thanks to all the panelists for joining us today. Um, Mark teed up this event as posing really three questions. Uh, number one, do we have a concentration problem? 
Uh, number two, does is there a corollary to a problem with competition that arises because we have a concentration problem? And number three, has uh, public policy been a deterrent to that effect or uh, an accelerant? And for a policy audience here in Washington, I think it's really tempting and tantalizing to jump straight away to the policy uh, discussion and debate. But I want to po pause us, if we could, just for a few moments here, because I think it's really quite important to uh, think about and to talk about and get your perspectives on measurement, on the issue of measurement. Uh, and in particular, what I want to ask the panelists about are three things. I'll just telegraph them. Number one, are we measuring the right thing when we talk about increased concentration? Are we measuring the right thing? Number two, are we using the right tools? And number three, are the results robust? So let me just turn to the first question. Uh, as a matter of proper economics, when we think about uh, concentration, are we measuring the right thing here when we, when we measure industry concentration, or should we instead be measuring market concentration? Let me uh, first turn to Stepan, then maybe Thomas, and then Luke. Yes, so, so about measurement. I mean, I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of important questions about measurement. The, you know, this debate in some sense ignited when people started to build a, what seemed like a very consistent story from the pieces of evidence that they, they, they gathered. The first one was this increase in national concentration, that there were some important papers claiming, well, markups have been increasing you know, throughout this period. Uh, and then there's some evidence on profits. And, and so all of that and the share of labor was starting to uh, seem to be declining. And so that all painted uh, a picture that seemed very consistent with, well, there's this increase in the, uh, or, the, or this lack of competition that is progressively a problem. And so that, in some sense, that's, that, that's why we are today in this debate that all of that seemed to kind of align in a way that, well, maybe one piece of evidence is not great, but you know, at the end of the day, once you put it all together, it's kind of all consistent and it, it, it seems very credible. And now I think the, question, the, the problem is that measuring markups is a complete mess. We don't really know how to measure them well. We may be able to measure them in very narrow industries with very specific technologies, but doing a cross country, uh, cross industry study of markups and their evolution is full, full of really, really, really tricky uh, issues, both conceptual and in terms of the data that we can put together. And so there's huge controversy about what's happening in, uh, uh, with markets. Concentration is much easier to measure, uh, but then it has all these problems that I was re referring to, which is, well, you have to define what the market is and whether you know you want to think about local or aggregate concentration. And then, like I said, we see very different uh, trends depending on which one you, you focus on. And so that's the conundrum really, that once you, you start kind of looking at the particular pieces of evidence, you see, well, the ones that are easy to measure, you know, show very different things, while um, the ones that are really difficult to measure, you know, there's a lot of controversy exactly what we're finding and, you know, are very hard to generalize like, across, uh, across sectors. And so that's really where we are. To me, the key issue is, that to think about exactly how is it that these top firms that, that seem to be very successful and are gaining market share in the US economy, how are they achieving that, that, that leadership role? How did they become big firms that kind of can expand and can go into these other markets? And what I see when I see these firms is a lot of successful innovation and a lot of successful investment in the capacity to deliver those services. So I think about, so Toma talked about Walmart. I mean, Walmart is a classic example, but you can think about all sorts of different innovations in many industries, including, for example, the healthcare industry, where consolidation has led to innovation that has allowed these firms to expand across markets. 
And so, you know, that doesn't mean that they have not increased their profits in some way, but, but as we know well, sometimes profits are also a compensation either for good ideas, right? Or a compensation for past investments that have allowed for that expansion. And so we have to be careful in not saying, well, any sort of increase in profits, right? Is, is some sort of self-evident um, a proof or it's, a, it's a, an obvious proof that they are increasing uh, increasing uh, market 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 power. So I think there's there's huge measurement problems that we have to be very careful about. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think there's some facts that are solid. I think the fact that is solid is that we've seen big declines in local concentration. I think that's very hard to question. And and the other is that we're seeing these firms invest more in R&D and invest more in uh, management. So we see them have more employment in those two things and more employment, more establishment in those, uh, in those two things. And those are clear, uh, or that's clear evidence that they are investing more in uh, fixed cost that allows them to do this expansion. Well, Stepan, thank you. Uh, Thomas, uh, as a matter of sort of proper economics, should we really be in trying to draw a link between concentration and competition, should we be focused on market concentration or these broader measures of industry competition? Or in industry Oh, no, so, so, that's the, so the second one is an easy answer. If we can, of course, the only thing that matters is the market concentration. Uh, the only question is, is, can we get good measures of what, what the relevant market is, which is uh, what Esteban was discussing, also what Luke uh, was mentioning. But if we, if we had market measure, we would not look at anything else. Um, now, uh, th there's a couple of, of issues. So uh, what's easy to measure is not the most useful. I think that's the big issue. You know, it's the story of the guy looking for his key under the, under the lamp, even though he lost his key in the park, right? Um, so, uh, but it is, on the other hand, you know, if something is stable for 50 years and you see it trending up at some point, at the very least, you can ask yourself why. Um, so to me, that's the, that's the thing. I never thought of conservation as being like a sign of either way, just telling something was happening. Um, and so, you know, you track it over time, you see it kind of stable for a long time, then it starts to move, you're like, okay, something is happening. Um, so it's, it starts, it's the impulse to start the research, um, but it's the beginning of the process, not the end, okay? It's like step zero. Um, now, the, the issue is that we, the, the stuff that really matter, we don't measure it very well. Uh, markups, I agree with Esteban. Uh, now, profits, we do. I mean, you know, we like to beat on the accountant. The truth is profits are pretty straightforward and, profit, and dividend payments are even more straightforward. So I think the, the fact that firms have increased their dividend payout, that's pretty much uncontroversial, it is easy. The only question is why? And it could be uh, you know, reward for, uh, of course, uh, good ideas in the past. It could be reward, and some of them are embedded in intangible assets, uh, or it could be just higher market power. And of course, my idea is it's both. Um, the thing I don't see is why we would have a higher aggregate value of dividend payments today than in the past, if we don't see a large increase in the stock of, of intangible assets. Um, that's what I think that uh, it's clear that in steady state, you always want some positive dividend and profits to reward innovation. I just don't see why it should have gone up so much in the past 20 years, because I don't see the flip side, which is higher investment in intangible assets. We don't see that in the data. So that's my, that's my main issue. The second thing I want to say is, to me, the, uh, uh, in terms of concentration, there are two things that we can still say some things about concentration, uh, even though it's not a perfect measure. The, and two things to me are key. One is this idea of contestability. And actually it goes back to uh, the sheet. One of the arguments uh, for the Chicago School was uh, for a more less fair approach was precisely contestability, which is you know, at the end of the day, as long as the market is contestable, then we are, we're gonna be fine in the long run. And I kind of agree with that statement. The problem is, uh, I don't think many markets have remained very contestable. And I definitely know that we don't have good measure of that. So I would like a much better measure of actual contestability of markets. My little proxy with turnover is just a proxy, okay? But I think that's key. Um, the second thing I wanna say before, uh, before handing back to you is uh, concentration is tricky because sometimes what really matter is bottlenecks or gatekeepers. So imagine like Apple with the App Store, or Amazon with the retailer. You can have a gazillion industries all producing little goods and they're all extremely competitive and differentiated, but they all sell through Amazon who has monopsony power over these guys. Then you're gonna find 99% of industries are extremely unconsumed. It doesn't really matter because all the bottleneck is one. I think 
you can see that in some markets. You see that with Apple on the App Store. You see that with Amazon in some of the retailers. You see that in agriculture. Like you could say, well, all these little uh, firms are competitive with each other. I agree. The problem is there are four people who can sell them seeds and they have three people who can buy their, their beef. And so uh, these are the key. And then so in, in fraction of industries or like in, in the grand scheme of distribution of establishment, most of them are, are very competitive, but it's enough to have one or two key uh, gatekeepers or bottlenecks and then you get big price effect. I don't think it's I think it's the, the evidence that farmers have been squeezed by uh, beef packing is pretty strong. I mean, their their share of the price of uh, beef uh, fell a lot. I mean, it used to be above 50 and now it's below 40. Um, so I think these are, and, and again, it's consistent with many local markets being quite competitive. I don't disagree with that. But if you have bottlenecks at the uh, aggregate level, I think this, you can still have concentration issues. Um, and to me, the, the one place where all this meets together in like the perfect storm is uh, broadband internet which is both national with big players, but also exactly as in Esteban's data, extremely local. And this one is a, is a mess. And I don't know what the solution is. I don't know what the, what's going on. All I know is when I measure the end outcome, it looks very bad. Luke, let's turn to you uh, as a matter of economics. I have the same question to you that I asked the other panelists. As a matter of economics, should we really be focusing on market concentration or these broader measures of industrial concentration? I think, I think you may have already answered that, but, but I want to give you another bite of the apple. Yeah, okay, yeah, you, you obviously weren't listening to my presentation, but <laughs> no, that, yeah, I mean, that's what antitrust does. They say, what, well, look, you know, where, where can market power be, be, or competition, you know, enforcers do? Where can market power be exercised? How can we, how can we protect, protect competition in, the, in those areas? And, uh, and bottlenecks has has become the you know the new trigger word you know okay we don't have to define markets but yeah let's just call them a bottleneck okay let's let's look let's look at Amazon I mean you know are, what kind of bottleneck are they well if you wanna if you wanna get on get online and you're a firm you can go to Shopify and in one day they can they can they can hook your inventory management system and get you get you a get you on the web. And they can even put you on Amazon in your own store. I mean, it is, uh, and Amazon charges, a, you know, charges a very small, relatively small fee for, 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 for finding, you know, for, for, you know, they, they do charge a, charge a fee, but, but it's, it's relatively small. And, you know, think about, think about the competition that they've, that they've um, been able to, increase in this country. I mean, it used to be, you know, you're, you're limited by your local geographic retailer. Now, now you can go online and, and, uh, and a lot of retailers have gone out of business. And I think that was an indication that we were getting screwed by these local retailers. I mean, they, you know, they were doing the best they could given their outmoded technology, but, but the huge economies of distribution economies of, 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 of the platform e e economies, those are those are awesome, and you know, just going to individual. Okay, let's talk about individual cases. Look at airlines. I mean, oh my goodness, the the four from the there's you know the HHI and airlines on a national level has gone way up, but on on individual routes has gone way down. You know, there's no in, really? at least in the United States. Yeah, I would let no 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 sorry I'm sorry I because that's not what the wait, data wait, wait, is. just let me talk and then and then you can and we can go back, but. Uh, the the at, at, on the national on the national level, you know, you look at airlines and the and the aggregate concentration has gone way up. You know, there's basically four four big national airlines, but on individual routes, you see lots and lots of competition, and and it's it's driven driven not just by 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 uh, not just by by the number of actual competitors, but it's it's driven by the network economies. You know, there's huge huge network economies of of running a of running an airline across multiple markets, but the DOJ evaluates all the mergers, and they 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 look at they look at uh, you know is is there anything preventing contestability? Is there anything to to you know? And you talk about the fear of fear of uh, fear of being replaced. You know, has gone down. I mean, talk about airlines. It's so easy to add a route you know, to a non slot constrained air airline. And, and so the DOJ, when they look at airline mergers, they'll look at, 
look at airports where that are slot constrained and they'll make make an entrant or they'll make a, a merger a merge firm kind of spin off the those slots but that's the that's the constraint and uh, kind of identifying those kind of spe specific specific constraints is just critical are we using the right tools <laughs> i think yeah i mean going you know the 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 stuff that we can do as antitrust enforcer, or we used to do is I'm not I'm no longer with the agencies, but but that's that's absolutely critical. And we have great tools; they're getting better all the time. The methodologies are getting better, the data is getting better, and and I think the the individual individual predictions about or measurement of the loss of competition within local markets is getting much much better. Uh, are these results results robust? Yeah, I think they're I think they're fabulous uh, at the individual level, and I think that all this focus on this aggregate level, you know, the 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 problems that all three of us have brought up, you know, is just is just masking what's going on at the individual level. I mean, we we can identify the loss in competition on individual routes. Thanks, Tomas. I think you may have a different perspective on airline competition. I know that you've identified a number of the industries in your research that you feel like you've sort of called out as being uh, poster children for this increasing concentration problem. Airline, you mentioned internet uh, broadband internationally and there's some debate about that, but you also mentioned in your research airlines and. And I know maybe you'd like an opportunity to respond to. to oh, you know. no, no, I was just surprised. So I agree that for airlines, you want to measure at the root level, but I think precisely that the data shows there is concentration, there is increasing concentration at the root level in the US. I think but, that, that but I mean, you, you talk about a contestable air, a contestable industry. All you need to do is rent a plane. You don't even need to buy the plane. You can rent a plane and enter a enter a point to point market. It, unless, agree, but that's the same in every country. We constrained. have this. No, no, I don't disagree. But, but that's the same in every, uh, I mean, the US and Europe are very similar in that respect. And we see prices going way down in Europe compared to US in, for air travel and, and uh, decreasing concentration, although it's far from being perfectly competitive there. But also thanks to uh, Ryanair and EasyJet, uh, it's way cheaper now than, uh, than in the US. It used to be the opposite. So let me, if I could, just ask one more uh, question in this area, and then I want to turn it back over to Mark. Um, I mentioned that uh, an important question is how robust are the results that we are getting that are pointing toward increased concentration? And um, uh, because it's quite important if you're going to hang your hat on a story that says competition is diminishing as a result of increased competition, concentration, the predicate is that you have to have increased concentration. And uh, Stepan, you've noted that when you measure concentration at a, at a geographically more constrained level, you get decrease in concentration. Luke, you've identified that if you measure con concentration at a reduced product level, as opposed to national, at a national level, you get, you get uh, the opposite result. And, and I guess I'm, I want to understand how confident we are about the claims of increased concentration. I know that, Tomas, you've identified, you've indicated that uh, increased concentration is at this point a stylized fact. It, we, it's something we can go to the bank with. Do you, in light of studies like uh, Stepan's, the, the discussion of the breadth of product market that Luke has, uh, in light of the other papers that are coming out now showing that concentration is either flat, like the Chamber of Commerce recent study, or the uh, Mary Amiti and, um, and Hesse study that shows that if you take economic concentration data and you account for exports and imports, you don't get this, this increased trend. Are you, are you still comfortable with the proposition that we've got a concentration problem? And I'll let you have last word on this. Uh, I mean, yes, in the sense that I think that there, there, is a lot of, there is a lot more industries where we have a concentration problem than we used to. 
Um, but no, so some of the things you mentioned, so first of all, the world on manufacturing, I did that five years ago. And yeah, manufacturing is obvious that you have, I mean, first of all, any, any industry which is subject to international trade, forget about it. Okay, if competition is coming from abroad, domestic concentration is, even if we had the right market, would even not be meaningful anyway. And we did that, well, I did that thing five years ago with manufacturing and yeah, I just took for import, there is half of manufacturing is competitive anyway. So that I fully agree. Um, what uh, Esteban shows, which is very strong in some uh, sectors, say retail or wholesale, I think there is no question that there you have uh, um, economies of scale that allow uh, you know, horizontal diversification and bring local competition in local markets. I mean, that to me is the Walmart story. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it applied to more business models than Walmart. And I think that that's also true. But uh, on the other side, you have uh, you know, uh, 200 million people who have one or two internet providers to get a reliable high speed. That's still a fact. Uh, you know, then you have uh, the number of wireless carriers is you know, less than it used to be. Uh, it's less than in Europe now. And prices are twice as high. And so is their profit margin, by the way. Like the, uh, the, the re average revenue per user is twice as what it is, or at least twice as what it is in, in Europe in a more competitive market. So these are markets where, so I'm not saying, so the way to think about the US economy is it's extremely large and dynamic. And then there's always all kinds of stuff going on. So the mm -hmm. only thing you can ask is, is the balance less favorable than it used to be? We always have industry that goes through competitive dynamics where the leader gets better and expands and we see both higher productivity and more concentration and it's all good. And there's industry where we see the opposite. So the question is, do we see too many industries where we see the reverse? And I'm, I would still say that the answer is yes, definitely, especially compared to the past. Okay, thank you very much. Mark, so, me... John, John, before yeah. we maybe transition, there's a couple of relevant questions in the Q&A. Um, one from Sean Fisher, who noticed that several of the slides that you all showed only have data up to the mid to late 2010s, uh, but did not necessarily show results for the past two years. So his question is uh, around what we can conclude about concentration in the COVID-19 years. Oh. Uh, what do you guys, has concentration increased, decreased more than it would have? Thoughts, uh, quick thoughts there? We That's don't have that much data. I mean, uh, you, the, the only data that get updated quickly are firm annual reports. Um, so of course, then you see the, the big impact of COVID is really that any business that were well positioned to take advantage of, to, to pivot towards the using uh, internet has grown a lot. And so mechanically, you know, of course, you're going to have some more concentration uh, in some market, but it doesn't mean necessarily that it's lack of competition there. I'm a, I'm a moderator, not a, a panelist, but let me just weigh in here to say that most of the studies that have been done on economic concentration use the economic census data that are produced only every five years. The most recent of those was produced in 2017. And so the only study I am aware of that incorporates the 2017 data is one that just was released in the last month by the Chamber of Commerce and might point people to that. Yeah, yeah although that story, that, 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 that thing is, uh, I don't know what's the right word, slightly misleading in the sense that they show that uh, construction is good, going down in manufacturing in sectors where nobody ever argued that there was construction in the first place. They also show that taxi cab uh, have reacted to Uber by emerging. Okay, fine. Nobody ever argued there was lack of competition there. But they don't point out that in all the sectors I mentioned, like you know, airline travel, telecom resellers, wireless telecom carriers, HMO medical centers, in all of these, construction is way up between 2012 and 2017. So just to be clear, so when we read that study, just keep that in mind. I mean, I think one, one thing when we just, just make one comment about that, I mean, there's an issue with data. So we're waiting for, for the data to come online in order to be able to continue these trends. And so it's hard to talk about, the, about you know, what has happened without that. But, you know, it's clearly, clearly one can point to certain industries as examples of any, you know, that favor any sort of position any, any of us has taken in this debate. I mean, there's certainly examples of, of, in, in all of this. And I think the telecom case that uh, Thomas has been pointing to is clearly one example that, you know, favors the, the story where there, there has been, there have been increases in concentration, 
but it's also an industry you know that is heavily heavily regulated there's a lot of you know natural monopoly characteristics to that industry etc and so you know there's active regulation that matters a lot for how that industry develops while you know we have to think about other industries that develop more organically as a result of changes in you know technology etc and what's happening in those industries and so i think there's you know clear distinction a clear distinction between the type of industries that we're talking about to me overall if we want to think about overall what i see when i look at the data and the trends in the data is that overall we've seen clear declines in concentration in all major sectors in the us economy at the local level right that doesn't mean that there's no sectors where we've seen increases in concentration there's definitely sectors at the local level there's certainly sectors that, that look like that but on average, at the sectoral level, employment weighted, sales weighted, whatever weight you want, pretty much that makes sense, uh, you find those declines in local concentration. Could I ask one more uh, question that's come up? Uh, Luke, to your question, Luke, on contestability in airlines, uh, Paul Nelson asks, and I'm going to paraphrase Does the same argument of contestability apply to some of the platform economies? Uh, I think, I think it, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. There, there are, there are big network economies of, of, uh, of, you know, of, of networks. And, uh, so there, you know, there's, there's first mover advantages, but, but if all I, all I could say is that if somebody tried to, you know, you, th you think about, uh, sowing, then reaping, you know, somebody, if somebody stopped, sowing and started reaping i think that there's so much competition that at least in 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 the united states i can't really speak to europe but there's so much competition that that would that that once you started reaping you know that 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 uh you would get a lot a lot more competition and that's you know going to 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 thomas's uh point you know the fear of being replaced is <laughs> is you know you know you can look at that and say, well, maybe it's gone down because there's less, there's less turnover, but you could also say, look, there's less turnover because people are so afraid of being replaced that they're, that they're doing the right thing. And I, I certainly see that with the, the companies that I consult with, you know, they're, they're, they're so focused on, on innovation and, and, and staying one step ahead of the curve. It's, it's unbelievable. Great. Uh, Mark, turn it back over to you. Sure. So this has been really helpful. Let me um, see if we can pull together a couple of threads. Uh, we don't have violent agreement on all points, but to see if there are a couple of common um, conclusions about where we've come to so far. And then I want to pivot to the antitrust discussion more, more explicitly. Um, I, I think we have general consensus, and Thomas, tell me if I'm wrong, that where we can analyze markets in the sort of economic, call it antitrust sense, that that's, that's preferable, that gives us a better insight as to uh, competitive conditions than looking, say, at broad industries in some census data set. Okay, fair enough. And, and if that's true, I want to separate the antitrust narrative, which we've been talking about today, into two buckets. One is the broad theme, and you see it a lot, I mean, you know, Assistant Attorney General Cantor just a few weeks ago in a speech talked about sort of 75% of industries becoming more concentrated. The broad industry look, it seems to me we can say, is at best um, a highly controversial way to look at relevant con concentration. Um, I would note, by the way, and it only came out a few weeks ago, so I don't, and I don't want to ask the panelists to respond to something you may not have looked at, but Robert Kulik at NERA uh, published a study, it was released by the US Chamber, looking at the same NERA data sets that the CEA and others who have been oft cited by the antitrust reform movement for this concentration concern. And he found generally declining concentration across the industries in the census data. He found a tendency of industries to revert to the mean so that the more concentrated industries tended to deconcentrate. And he found generally the higher concentration correlated with positive economic outcomes. I throw that out there. I commend it to folks who want to go see some other recent scholarship on these topics. But let's set the near the, the census data broad industrial look to the side for, for a moment. We've had a good discussion of that sort of perspective. 
I'm struck by the fact that everyone's comments have tended to go toward particular industries, which is, I think, arguably where the discussion really is helpfully focused. And so, for example, let me turn this question then to Luke uh, initially. If we're looking now, if we sort of set aside broad census data about industries and look at relevant markets, um, we've got a few. You talk about some in your antitrust magazine paper, Don't Panic. Uh, you go through airlines, and we've had a bit of a discussion on that. You talk about banking. Uh, telecom has come up a lot. Um, it, how, how do we get a handle on how antitrust has fared in looking at these particular industries? Because I think virtually every industry I've talked about has gone through M&A and much of it's been reviewed by the antitrust agencies. Do we need more merger retrospectives where the antitrust agencies or others or academics go and do a, a relook at the antitrust analysis of, of industry of markets that have been reviewed before? Is that a way to start to gauge the third question on our agenda today, which is has antitrust succeeded or failed in, in dealing with co competition issues? Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah, I, I would say just, just the innovations I've seen during my lifetime uh, or my professional lifetime, it's just, it's been unbelievable. You know, when I came to the agencies, we're using structural presumptions and, and that's basically all we had. And, you know, then, then market delineation got much better. And then, you know, kind of people started, oh, what's going on in this specific industry on a case by case basis? What's going on in this industry and how, how do the firms compete and how will this merger affect that competition? I think those are the right, right questions to ask. And we've got much better answers over time. And, uh, you know, using a variety of methodological tools. And I, I, I applaud that and, you know, you know, uh, growth comes out of conflict and th these kinds of, uh, these kind of tried to get a sense of that, you know, but I've, I've been involved in, in these debates, you know, you know, over my professional lifetime. And, and I've seen, seen a lot, you know, I was, I, re I still remember the tail end of the profits concentration debate or the margin concentration debate, and then it turned into a price concentration debate. And finally, you know, people, people gave up, but uh, there's always, there's, a, you know, there's this huge endogeneity problems. We see stuff and we don't know what's causing what. And we see correlations and we have to infer causality from correlations. And I think that's, that's, a, that's even if you saw a kind of uh, increasing concentration and increasing, increasing margins or profits or prices, uh, what, what could you infer about that? And, um, you know, there's, you know, uh, there's, you know, we all know about spurious correlation. These are two, two endogenous variables, and 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 you know, we all know how to how to, you know, we all all been trained in econometrics. We all know how to how to tease out causality from correlation, and and none of that's being done at this level, and uh, and so that's 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 you know, and and I can't believe we're still talking about correlation and causality, you know. You know, fifty years after Fisher, it's just uh, anyway. It just anyway. That's that's where I think, and and we're all academics. You know, we're careful about this stuff, and you got to get, you got to get, you got to, you know, to get published, you have to, you know, you have to, you have to really tease out this stuff. And and uh, anyway, did I answer that question? Sure. I mean, retrospectives. Do you think? Oh, retrospectives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did a bunch of those in on the gasoline mergers. We were getting hammered by. Uh, you know, every every uh, every May, when everybody gets out of school and goes on a road trip, there's a spike in demand, and people people call Congress. That's the one thing that that the grocery stores and and gasoline. That's the thing that that generates the most antitrust complaints to to Congress. And we would always open an investigation and 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 you know look look closely about what's happening and and conclude there was nothing there, but. Um, yeah, retrospectives. So we went back and did retrospectives. We did a diff and diff uh, retrospectives of uh, differences and differences retrospectives. So look at markets that that uh, that didn't have the merger, markets that did have mergers, and and took the the difference um, between them. And so pre and post merger, and then um, then across the control and the and the experimental markets which, which did experience mergers, and we found no effects. And uh, and you know so those retrospectives are useful I think but 
but they're very difficult to do. Uh, you know, we only were able to accomplish them with the subpoena power of the FTC. And, uh, and we, we um, you know, and, and I, I think that, that so much changes over time. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to do, do really good ones. For the other panelists, um, you have your views on whether we have a concentration or competition problem or both. Do we have an antitrust problem? And if so, what is it? Maybe Thomas, we'll go with you first. Well, so just to follow up on what Luke was saying, the one thing that when I uh, started writing on these topics uh, five years ago, that was the most shocking to me is the lack of good retrospective. Like it's amazing. I would never have imagined that there is not like a systematic way for every single decision to then be modeled exposed and kept track. And then when I started looking that I could find like Ashenfelter had a couple of papers at Princeton looking at five cases or whatever, it's like, the fact that it's not like a systematically completely industrialized automatic process, I find that absolutely shocking. So the truth is we don't know because nobody has done the work. And um, oh, except of course, I mean, the, a few specific, the one you mentioned, Luke, the, the, the one I, I mentioned by uh, Orly at, at Princeton, but that's the very few. Um, so I think that's kind of shocking and we should have had a lot more of that. Though the ones that I did see are not, the, 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 they usually don't find the benefit that we are assume at the time of the merger, but I don't know if it's true for all of them. There's um, there's been some special <laughs> issues uh, uh, of some journals that have looked at retrospectives. Mike Vita uh, edited a special issue of I forget one of the IO journals, and they did it was all published with retrospectives. But there's there's no there's no demand for it really. I mean, you know, all of us want to know, but but. Uh, but you know you can't get that published. It's very hard to get those kind of stuff published. I completely agree. But to me, that's exactly the definition of a public good, which is yeah. everybody has an interest in knowing the answer, but there is not a market that has enough demand to get that thing done. So that's that's something that should be uh, you know essentially implemented by uh, by the public uh, authority. Well, and if so I could just it's, step it's out of the good. role for a second here, sorry. You know, I've been on the government side and for many years on the side of the regulated. Um, the, the, the pros of retrospectives are, it's in my view, the only way to really know what past antitrust action or inaction has, has led to. Uh, on the other hand, as Luke sort of suggested, it can only really be done with the power to get data. That is probably the government power to require data. That is costly for the government and it's costly for the regulated firms. But if we really want to know what antitrust has been doing or not doing and what the impact of that has been, I think my, my two cents is this is the only way to do it. But let me turn it back to Esteban for the broader, well, for that question or the broader question of do we have an antitrust problem? And if so, what is it? Yeah, let me just say one one thing about this. It's, I mean, it's not that easy to do in the sense that, I mean, at the end of the day, these retrospective studies, I mean, we're talking about a contrafactual. And these contrafactuals are not, I mean, we need to model that contrafactual and how to model those contrafactuals, particularly <laughs> when circumstances are changing and when the use of technology has been changing the way it has in the last, you know, several decades uh, are a big problem, right? How exactly do we think about innovation in the industry and the contrafactual innovation that we would have had had we prevented this merger or uh, allowed this other one, is uh, is really really hard to 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 understand. Particularly when these industries are going through major changes, where the technologies that they're using in order to operate in their business have changed in dramatic ways. And so, you know, as an editor of the JP, if you actually do that well, right, in in one particular industry or many. I certainly would be interested in your paper, right? But uh, but the, I think the question, the issue is, is very hard to do well. And don't and don't forget selection bias. You know why are the firms merging? You know it's it's, it's you know they either they're profitable, they got money to spend, or they're unprofitable and they, and they need to change. You know, and so you get you get and, and everything's so idiosyncratic. So that's 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 what makes these studies so hard to do, you know, aside from Esteban's point that we don't observe the counterfactual, what would have happened but for this, which is exactly the causality point that I was trying to make. Yeah, but, but let's I all mean, agree that these are all reasons for doing it. 
precisely because it's hard, precisely because it's endogenous. These are all the reasons why exactly we need to do it. And oh, the, the thing to I agree with in I, mind I mean, is that by the time finish, of the I agree, I agree with that, but it's not an afterthought that we can just throw to, to a government agency and say, well, we know how to do it, go do it. Uh, except for one you know, thing, we, except for, there's, except there's, a, there's a very strong putty clay technology part here, which is that at the time where the decision is made and the merger is decided for or against, people like you do the analysis. So they do build the model, they do have the data. So that cost is paid. The cost of the incremental cost of, you know, keeping enough data so that you can, you can prolong the curves and test whether the model that were, the model already been built for the case. So the thing that's shocking to me was that we didn't have a way of just being able to build on that. It's not building something new, just build on that to keep track of what it does after that. That's the part that to me is a market failure. So, okay. so, so we did, we did a, we did a, 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 a retrospective study of hospital mergers because we'd lost you know, 10 hospital mergers in a row at the FTC. And so we went back and looked at all the mergers we'd lost. And because that's where you can observe, <laughs> observe the merged world. And again, but it, again, we didn't observe the non-merger world. So, we, you know, what was the counterfactual? We had to model the factual actually, but, but uh, and when, and, and the results of that study is that prices went up and we changed, we changed hospital merger policy and used that to go into court and as evidence and we started blocking hospital mergers and uh, got us back in the hospital merger business. So we, so the agencies do do it where they see, uh, you know, a clear, a clear reason to do it. But I think only the FTC has, you know, Mark would know better than than I, uh, has the ability to to run studies like that. Um, that's they do have that clear uh, ability. They have used it. Um, a lot of people, Dennis Carlton and others have, have said, this is where more resources should be put. And I'm obviously in that camp, but let me take this now issue and pull us then back to the, the last question for the panelists. And then we'll see if there are more questions from the audience. Um, because it just building on the observation that, and I'm in agreement with Thomas here, if it's, it's hard, but it's because it's hard that it's necessary. And I guess I'd pose the question the other, the other way, on what do you base policy decisions if not looking at the actual consequences as best you can of antitrust interventions or non-interventions? So then the question for all of you is what's, what's the next step for antitrust? Given everything we've talked about and your views on what, the, what if any problem, uh, systemic competition problem there is, I wanna come back and ask each of you just to address to the extent you're comfortable what is the state of antitrust today and, and should it be changed? Yeah, or if you don't want to make particular legislative proposals, um, what are the metrics? How do, we, how do we analyze antitrust reform? What questions should we be asking in order to come to a sensible view here? Um, let's go back to our uh, original order, perhaps, and we'll go, uh, we'll go uh, Thomas, Esteban, and Luke. So first, I think uh, just to wrap up the previous question, better uh, systematic retrospectives. Uh, for, it has to be part of the process that anything that's studied should have then automatically a follow-up so that the effort that we are done to build the model are just uh, keep, kept going. And I don't think the costs are very high if, if you do it ex ante because everything is automatized now. The data, for instance, the data, once the firms have the data feed to figure out the price, the, the information you need to give, you know, you can mostly automatize that. Ex it's very high costly five years later to come back and ask to do it again. But if you do it at, at T plus one, I think it's fine. So that would be like priority number one. Priority number two um, is the, so, oh, so sorry, I should say something. So then there's the debate also, of, you know, is the consumer welfare standard um, the right one? Or, so unfortunately, I don't know if they, on anybody on the panel, I don't think we can have a fair discussion because I, I don't think so. I think it's fine to keep the consumer welfare standard. I don't think that the, that the critical idea is to change that. Um, I just think we need to apply it better, but I would not be in favor of changing that. So I don't think anybody is going to be advocate for the other side, but that's, that's an issue that people discuss. Um, I think that it should be uh, smart in the sense that, uh, you know, if you if negative impact on, on potential competitors that reduce um, the, the breadth and quality of product available to consumer five years later, to me, that's the consumer welfare standard. Even though in the short term, you would measure it as, uh, you know, maybe harm to, to, to competitors. But the goal is if it's harm to competitors that doesn't harm consumers, I don't care about it. So I'm still fine with that. Um, and the third to me, to go back to what I was saying earlier, I think, I, I, I think this idea of, of contestability is critical. 
And, um, you know, to some extent, uh, you know, markets where we feel there is not enough contestability are the one we should go after. Um, and it might not be a, a, an extremely large numbers, but I think these are the ones where, where we should be focusing on. Stephen. Yeah, so I think there's two main uh, issues with, you know, overreaching in, in terms of antitrust policy. The first one is technology, whether we're going to see technology suffer because the nature of technology has changed from uh, into a much more fixed cost based technology where firms have to invest a lot, both in terms of ideas and in terms of physical capital in order to produce what they're doing. Uh, and in terms of access uh, to of consumers, wherever they are, to uh, their goods. And the fact that, you know, in the moment uh, there's limits to expand, firms are going to go to the biggest, you know, most profitable markets, and they're going to kind of leave some of the other markets behind, hurting people in those markets. And so I think those two issues are issues that we need to really, really be very vigilant about. Now, let me end with this issue of contestability. I mean, I think that's a clearly important uh, notion to have in mind. The problem I think is that it's easy to think about contestability when you think about airline routes, but it's very hard to think about contestability when you think about supermarket networks. Because supermarket networks, you need to develop them, you need to invest in them, and to, to then get the profits uh, from those investments. And contestability is not cannot be measured then, you know, in a year, or it cannot be measured directly, uh, you know, for the whole country. It has to be measured in a different way, exactly because the nature of that technology has changed, exactly because in order to be able to, to, to sell at those low prices that Walmart sells, you know, you need the big network. Without the big network, you cannot sell at those prices. And so that's the question with contestability, contestability at what scale? We want contestability, but thinking about the scale at which we want contestability is really important. Uh, I would Oh, thank you. I would say, I would kind of act, uh, try to reframe what Esteban said a little bit by saying that, look, innovation is going to trump everything. You know, we all know our, our solo, you know, give me 1% you know, on top of GDP growth, and that's going to swamp anything that we're talking about here today. And uh, I think we got to be really careful that, that, uh, that antitrust and 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 government regulation doesn't doesn't harm uh, innovation. You know, Europe's share of GDP has gone from like a third down to a fourth or a fifth in the last couple decades, and and uh, maybe maybe post war, and uh, and uh, and and you look at you look at you know what's look at the innovation in europe i mean it's it, and it's it's really hard to measure but but one one metric is the number of unicorns you know firms that reach a billion dollar valuation and uh there hardly any of them are birthed in europe they're mostly in us and and us has about twice as many as china 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 has about twice as many as 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 the eu and uh that's that. That's the thing that I think, as as economists, we ought to spend more, much more time on. Is you know what what are we doing as a country to design design incentives to innovate and and giving people the 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 you know the regulatory freedom to 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 innovate and make mistakes. And uh, I think that 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 e, the EU, you know, kind of our tolerance for inequality in the United States. Has has allowed us to kind of accept these, the you know that hey, if I have a small chance of becoming a billionaire, you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take all your money if you become a billionaire. And so so you know if I have a you know if I have a one percent chance of innovating and hitting it rich, we're gonna let people get rich. You know we tolerate that kind of inequality in the United States, and and Europe doesn't. And uh, you know that's a very broad based statement, but. Uh, you know, China seems seems to have done that, but the, the President Xi seems to have kind of shifted course a little bit recently. But but uh, anyway, so I think that's 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 one really important area that that uh, you know we ought to we ought to think a, a lot more about. Uh, you know, the, all this all this static stuff that we're talking about. Yeah, I think those are moving deck chairs. 
on the Titanic. Well, thank you guys. Jeff, I think we have time for a couple of questions from the uh, audience. Sure, sure. We, we have one that's somewhat related and you guys have touched on, but maybe a little bit more flushing out from uh, Batya Zara. He asks, there's a heavy emphasis of price as a key determinant of consumer value, but other metrics might come into play. And he mentions a few based on the buying power, uh, based on efficiency or some measure of quality. And, and uh, maybe this push as well to ESG kinds of measures for consumer value. Uh, he in particular references Estefan's point that sometimes profit is an evidence of a good idea well executed so consumers will happily pay a premium uh, for that good or for that service. And, and so the, the broad, I guess, question is, is price what we should be focused on or should we be opening up uh, beyond price and looking at some other dimensions that might be important to consumers? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, I think you, you know, that this, this goes very, very much to the specificity, you know, the, of, of, of antitrust analysis, you know, that, that every case is different and you've got to figure out how do firms compete and how does a merger or whatever kind of any, you know, uh, behavior that, that's, that you're considering as offen offensive or against the law, how does that affect the competition? And it, and it changes, you know, firms can compete with product market innovation. They can compete uh, by, by advertising. They can, you know, they can compete by, you know, uh, by yield management, revenue management. I mean, there's lots and lots of ways that, that firms compete and they compete, you know, by, by setting cap capacity, expanding capacity. And, uh, and every case is different. And you, you, and I just, just emphasize, you've got to model how firms compete and then kind of think about how whatever, whatever behavior you're considering affects that competition. Yeah, I, I like to think of it as competing in price dimensions and then non-price dimensions, uh, at least the way in which I teach my students. Uh, Tomas, I interrupted you, it looks like. No, no, I was gonna say, I, I was gonna say the same thing. I, I fully agree. Uh, to me, the tricky question is, so of course, so to be clear, like the idea of price and non-price competition, what do people care about? People care about the price and the value they get. So you, would, you have to me measure the value they get. So that's an old idea, of course, that's what we've been doing all along. I think the tricky question to me is, <clears throat> is it the case that non-price effects are more important in today's market than they used to be? Um, I could tell the story either way. I don't think it's obvious, um, but maybe in, in uh, on the, the case of, uh, there are some cases where I think it's clear that it's more important, like say privacy. So that's a debate that's pretty hard today. That's a non-price effect that firms also compete on. Yeah. And so I think uh, at least in some industries, you can make the case that these non-price um, uh, effects are relatively more important today. And that means that we need to work harder to measure them properly with okay. privacy as an example. Esteban, final word? Yes, I mean, I, I agree that there's obviously other dimensions that we should uh, take into account and quality being, being clearly, clearly one of them. I mean, I think, I think the other aspect that I've been emphasizing uh, is access, right? I mean, the fact that a lot of these consumers simply don't have access to certain products and that part of the, what, the evolution that we've seen has been about access, has been about being able to consume those products of these large companies that are expanding. And, and that's something that we should take into account as well. Great. All right. With that, I think we're pretty close to the witching hour. Mark, John, any final sort of thoughts? We're good? No. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for participating. Uh, please uh, keep our website and our updates. Uh, look for, for more of these uh, antitrust discussions in the future. I uh, really appreciate those that attended. And, and I, again, want to thank the panelists for some excellent commentary and discussion. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you all. Everybody.